I'm mm, mm, pop that cat. That's my name, <laughs> cat. I'm just I got telling. really nervous before I did that. <laughs> mm, mm, just like that. Don't stop. Work it, bitch. We're doing it out of order. Uh, <laughs> Oops, that's I, my I bad. Got, I got nervous again because I'm like, wait. I don't know what I'm <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. Also, I just noticed you have a horse sticker on your water bottle no, now. No, it's Lil Sebastian. It oh, says, right. I met Lil Sebastian okay. at the Pony Harvest Festival. It's not just a horse. It's a pony, right? A miniature pony. That's what he is, right? He's a miniature horse. Oh, Oh, God. There's a whole bit in the show. He's not a pony. Yeah, I've he's seen a miniature it. So I've seen it so many times I forgot about it completely. <laughs> yeah. Also, this is night class. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. It's a podcast where two teachers unwind, sip wine, and we each teach a lesson we can't teach at school. And we talk about Parks and Rec and Meg the Stallion. And uh, SpongeBob. And SpongeBob in the office. Yeah. A those lot. are the main ones mm-hmm. SpongeBob in the office. Yeah. And we love Meg the Stallion. Yeah. Yeah, we just watched the Don't Stop music video, and it was a mood. Yeah, and there was a Parasaur in there. That's the studio we record at, Alex yeah. Studio, Parasaur Studios. Yeah, and we always listen to Meg to pump us up for the podcast, and so we took it as a sign. I'm not sure a sign of what, but it felt good. A sign of being awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Someday we'll be on Meg's level. No, we won't, but... You don't know that. (laughs) You don't know that. I don't know what for, but you know. I mean, I wonder how many podcasts have done a whole thing about her life. Probably none. We should write to her. We should. Yeah. We should spam her. Yeah. We shouldn't. But we should write to her (laughs) every week. We should tweet at her incessantly until she likes one of our tweets. And then she listens to it and she's like, you got this wrong and you got that wrong. She's like, and this is not okay. And I hate you guys. And then we'll stop doing that classy forever. No, we will just be teachers. <laughs> no, just kidding. Just Instead kidding. Instead of adult stuff, she's like, you should stop. Mm, mm. <laughs> and we're like, our jaws drop. And she's like, just like that. She's like, mm, mm, fuck you, cat. Mm, mm. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> well, that's not what we anticipated the parasaur in the music video to mean. No, but I don't know what it means, but it, <laughs> it, it can't be It seemed that. like a good sign. <laughs> Anyway, what are we drinking, Ailey? We are drinking uh, Boda Box. <laughs> bow, bow, bow. We've never drank Boda Box. Except it's for crazy. Tuesday this <laughs> and time. all the other days. Very special. Last episode of 2020. What a year it's been. We are celebrating. We're getting out of our box with a Boda Box. This is not sponsored. I need to stop saying their name. Uh, the flavor, <laughs> you may ask? The flavor. <laughs> 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 what would you call it? I'd call the it type? red wine and it's called red volution, which is very I, clever. Way to steal my lines. <laughs> it's like all I get to say on this freaking podcast. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you don't seem sorry. I'm not sorry. <laughs> I know you're not, but we're drinking. We've been drinking. <laughs> oh, we've, we've been drinking alcohol. <laughs> oh, we are not on the same wavelength. I was going to go like the, so we've been drinking, we've been drinking, like do it twice. Like Beyonce does in her song. Oh yeah. Well, oh, well. I just skipped ahead. You skipped it. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, Beyonce. Oh, well, can't. we're on Meg's team. I can't sing as well as you. All right. <laughs> well, yeah. Last episode of 2020. Thank God. Happy New Year's Eve, everybody. Yes. Yeah. Drink, drink or don't drink, whatever you need to do. Yeah, we were going to drink champagne on this episode for New Year's Eve because we also just have a bunch in our fridge. And then we were like, no, let's save it for the actual New Year's Eve. Yeah, we're recording on Monday, which yeah. is released on Thursday. Yeah. And Thursday is New Year's Eve. And math. Yeah, math, <laughs> math, math. We're going to have a New Year's Eve in the house. We're going to get a, we're going to dress up. For ourselves. Yeah, for for nobody but ourselves and our Instagram followers. Yeah, a quarantine New Year's <laughs> Eve. Yeah, quarantine. Quarantine, miss. <laughs> <laughs> what were we doing last New Year's Eve? I literally don't remember. Did we do anything? Oh, I was in Seattle. Oh, I don't know what I was doing. I was in Seattle and it was windy that day, so they didn't do the fireworks at the Space Needle. And... It, that's like the first time in my memory that's happened. And that should have been a sign for how 2020 was going to go. It should have They been. didn't do the fireworks. And we got this like hotel that overlooked the Space Needle and everything so that we could see the fireworks. And then there were no fireworks. So many signs. And then I went to bed at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> so many signs and we ignored them. Yeah. As 
outdid our president. Yeah, <laughs> as did a lot of people. I learned a fun fact about New Year's Eve this week, actually. Really? Yeah, so when they created time zones, like before people just had like watches or an easy way to set their clocks, there was this ball in the sky that would come out at like noon. So everyone could be like, okay, it's noon. Let me set my clock I'm to sorry, noon. a ball in the yeah, sky? Yeah, like a sphere that they would raise in like town square. And they would see the ball and be like, okay, I need to set my watch to noon because I know that that ball means that it's noon. Why was and it, then they'd put it down. Why was it a ball? So you could see it. I don't know. Is that why they dropped the ball in Times Square? Yes. Oh. That's exactly why. But like daylight savings isn't at New Year's Eve. Okay. The, it's not related to time zones. It's just in the time, like in the era of like when they created time zones that's one of the things that they did. That's confusing and I don't like it. I don't <laughs> know if you're the only one confused. I, yeah, I'm probably the only one confused. <laughs> I don't, but I, I don't get it. <laughs> okay, just leave out the whole thing about time zones. Uh, some time ago, they used to raise a sphere in Times Square so that people could tell the time. And now that's how we get the ball dropping on New Year's Eve. Oh, yeah. Okay. There it is. Cool. <laughs> cool. 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 Okay, you don't have to hit my feelings on purpose. <laughs> It's not on purpose. I'm just drunk. <laughs> I would never hurt your feelings on purpose. Mm, maybe you wouldn't, but Claudia Severa would. <laughs> <laughs> Claudia Severa is she's a, Severa. She, she is Severa. Well, yeah, I I have a couple shout outs to do. Also, like, thank God. I mean, I kind of want to dwell on 2020 a little more. Like, thank Should we God do some it's reflecting? over. Should we, I mean, 2020 culminated in us yesterday having to flea bomb our house and uh, <laughs> things are not going great. So um, it'll be uh, it'll, some things yeah. are not going great. Yeah, that situation is not great. But 2020 <laughs> has been it has brought some pretty incredible things. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, if you want to reflect, we can't just make it all yeah, about the flea let's bomb. just let's just reflect on the good things. Take a walk down memory yeah, lane. Take a walk down memory lane. Um, well, last Thanksgiving, Haley and I like came up with an idea drunkenly for this podcast. Yeah. We and had so much fun just yeah. talking and being drunk. Uh-huh. And we went to her college friend's house and like told everyone about our podcast idea and everyone was like cool shut the fuck up we don't care <laughs> and then uh I uh, went on tinder like in early December when we came back and met Alec mm -hmm. and I told him about our podcast idea and he's like cool let's make it and then one thing led to another and I had a new relationship and a new podcast and then Haley and Tommy got together yeah and, and then we got cats yeah and then we got cats today's we... our anniversary <gasps> what oh, really yeah. oh, I'm oh my sorry God. I, really yeah oh happy anniversary yeah happy anniversary, happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Did, you, did you just too. remember that no, I knew. Well, why didn't you say something to me earlier? I didn't know. To trick you. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Don't be you. sorry. <laughs> okay, we'll celebrate eventually. Because when Alec and I started our relationship, we were, like, I was in Seattle, and we were just texting, and we were making a joke that, like, once you go to Olive Garden, Olive Garden together, you're official. And then uh, you're just like, well, you want to be official? And I'm like, well, yeah, I'm not seeing anyone anyway. That's oh, <laughs> nice little like uh, test no, there. It like, was I'm much not saying anyone. <laughs> Are you? It was much nicer than that. But then we were talking about getting Olive Garden on our anniversary, and I totally forgot. Well, we both like zoned out. And had yeah, busy it's days. so it's so close after Christmas. Like I mm -hmm. knew it was coming before Christmas, and then Christmas happened, and then my mind was all Christmas, and it's been hard to recover from that. You guys could celebrate your like half anniversary. Do it in the summer. It's like a fun time. Yeah, anyway. that's true. Because uh, the way our life goes, it's Christmas anniversary, my birthday. Yeah. And I feel like that's quick. not fair to our and anniversary. And then Valentine's Day. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty heavy. Well, Alec, if you propose someday, you'll have to do it like as far away from December as possible. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> Duly noted. Yeah. <laughs> so we can have a new anniversary that's not in the middle of chaos. <laughs> I was born on my parents' anniversary and then they got divorced. <laughs> 
<laughs> so your birthday is just that's good that your birthday like is a happy thing that replaced the memory of their anniversary yeah or it's just <laughs> something that both my parents have to like get through <laughs> because it's my birthday <laughs> oh my god I'm sure they don't think about each other anymore I don't like my parents don't give a fuck about each other anymore. Yeah. It's been a I hope while. not because my birthday is about me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the whole month of September. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. It's my birth month. Sorry about your failed marriage. <laughs> You've got a great kid. So <laughs> yes. But yeah. Any more reflections? We moved. Yeah. We moved into this mm-hmm. wonderful house that yeah. helps us um, get over challenges and obstacles on a daily basis. Uh, it <laughs> causes challenges and obstacles on a daily basis we our like, microwave stopped working oh yesterday my God, i forgot about that it's like uh, like i love our house so much but like it's it's like we're homeowners because our rental company doesn't do shit like we email them all the time about stuff and they just like put us on red like they leave us on red and we, we were have just to do everything ourselves and yeah. this house is falling apart we were just so eager when we were looking for a house mm-hmm. to be moved in during a pandemic like we were looking in april yeah and we needed a place so we saw that house we loved it i feel like we did not read the lease that well because i didn't know that we had to handle all the like applications like the appliances, fridge, appliances. yeah <laughs> <laughs> all the applications yeah i mean we talk about it all the time but it's old it's falling apart there was like water dumping from the ceiling the first night we moved in the fence got blown down the yard got dug up because there was sewage in the basement we have a possum now we have fleas and it's Alex telling us to stop complaining about the house but I'm not complaining like it's just it's just a lot it's a lot of stuff I got a new couch it's yeah pink. you it's got velvet. a new couch yeah 2020 was quite the time thank you guys for walking down memory lane with us <laughs> sorry if that was really boring um anything else <laughs> I know you have something you want to do. I'm going to get a couple of shout outs just into the open and then we can do your thing. Yes, please. So first of all, I just, I just want to shout out a Memphis business. They're a small business. They're called Bluff City Smugglers and they're an alcohol delivery service. They're not sponsoring us, but I just uh, like think they're great and they really filled a niche that like I've been wishing Memphis had for a while. So I'm very grateful for them. We've been using their services a lot and they're wonderful. And so if you're in Memphis, please check them out. They have an app called Bluff City Smugglers smugglers check it out it's like very very cheap affordable alcohol delivery it's awesome and then i also want to shout out our newest patreon supporter daniel faust of decatur alabama and he's awesome he's been a listener for a while he interacts with us on instagram and like we just love him and we're so thankful to have him as part of the patreon family and i asked him if there's anything he wanted us to like put in his shout out and he's like nothing except that i want everyone to know that my patreon money should be spent on alcohol alcohol and like buying alcohol and uh, we can definitely do that we can do that <laughs> yeah we can do that done and done and done done done, done. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much daniel and if you want to donate to us on patreon it helps us so much we have a lot of like fun projects and new merch and uh, a new like all kinds of stuff like stuff we want to do we also like desperately want to hire an editor and then that will allow us to make more content because alex time won't all be tied up in editing and we can make new stuff so please head on over to patreon.com slash night classy and uh, donate some money, be a supporter, join our family. And you also get access to all kinds of awesome bonus content. So, and other perks too. So please, please, please check that out if you're interested. And, uh, Thank you, Daniel and Haley. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Also, to clarify, none of the money from Patreon does go to our alcohol, and unless you specify specifically, <laughs> the alcohol has been an out-of-pocket expense until yes. Daniel came along. <laughs> we do it for you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so I have a surprise for the house. It's like an activity that we can do together. Okay. So it's like something for all of us. I I'll keep it, but it's something for all of us. All of us is in like everyone who lives in the house, everyone who lives in the house. Okay. Yeah. So right. I'm going to have, um, I guess Kat, do you want to like unwrap it? I just wrapped it. Sure. In a sweater. Um, what the hell is this? It's heavy. It is the heavy. <laughs> What is this, Haley? Just wait. <laughs> what the shit? It looks like an advent calendar. It is an advent calendar it that she drew on calendar. with pen. What the hell is this? It's the White House. What? It's a countdown <laughs> advent calendar. It's reverse. <laughs> oh my god! It's oh. a countdown till the inauguration. Yes. 
Oh my God. And she drew the White House on it with pen. Did you paint an advent calendar white and then draw the White House on it? Yes. Oh my <laughs> God. That is so cool. This Haley. is incredible. What Thank kind of you. stuff did you, can I open one? Yeah. So it starts each day has a dumb Donald Trump tweet or <laughs> one of his quotes that hasn't aged well or just something dumb that he said. So it starts here and it'll go this way all the way up. And then can I just, I'm just going to. No, sh- don't show us the last thing. That's it's for really the, funny. That's for the special day. Yeah, it's, that's for inauguration. Yeah. Day, right? Dang it, I want to show you so bad. Okay. No. Well, it starts right here. Okay. okay. Can I, how many do I open? Just one. It starts today. It starts today. It starts today. Yes. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So she opened a little door. It's like a little fortune cookie in here. Yeah. Okay, 24 days until December 27th. That's the date today. I had to keep track when I was putting them in because oh, I like strategically oh, okay. chose his quotes or tweets. Oh my God, you literally printed out his tweet format with like Donald, the real Donald Trump. Yeah. The thing. Also, it, it looks did. like there's chocolate or something in here. Oh. Okay. Sorry, losers and haters, but my IQ is one of the highest and you all know it. Please don't feel stupid or insecure. It's not your fault. 8.37 p.m. May 8th, 2013. Also, I feel like that's something we would fucking say on this podcast. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> wow. There's more to come. Wow. <laughs> what an amazing uh, president we have. Um, he's, um, he's something. He is something else. He's um, something else. And we hate his guts and want him to die. <laughs> so, cool. Thank you, Ailey. That You're is, welcome. That is really, really that cool. That is so cool. I love it so much. And you did such a good job drawing the White House. Thank you. How did you do that? I just looked at the White House and then I like then you freehanded I, I, it? Yeah. I, I just did it. Wow. <laughs> good job. Thank you. Uh, it looks very good. We'll put like a picture of this maybe on our Instagram story the day this comes out. So keep an eye out for okay. it. Sounds and good. I just dropped the tweet but I'm not going to pick it up. Oh, Make sure it makes it back in there because I want to keep oh, this. Okay. Then I will pick it up. Yeah. This is like an heirloom to future generations. Yeah. <laughs> Here's why we hate Donald Trump. Yeah. He's very stupid. <laughs> it's a weird time capsule. Wow. Thank so you. So there's that. That is You're amazing. welcome. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all I got. <laughs> that's all I've got too. You ready? Yeah. Well, we tried to breathalyze and it was, it's, this has been a long time coming, but our breathalyzer has officially stopped working. It is the end of the end. It's the end of the trail. So I, that's an Alec Og original song. <laughs> oh, okay. You can check out okay. Fins on Spotify by Alec Og. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so the, the breathalyzer doesn't work. We're going to use some Patreon money to get a good breathalyzer because this one was like $20 on Amazon and it's time for a good one now that now that we can invest some money into this podcast. We know it's going to keep going for a little bit. So level up. Level, level up. Level up. So the breathalyzer's broken and I haven't gone first in how many weeks? Three. Three weeks. So I'm going to go first and I'm excited about this because I like going first. <clears throat> Let me take a sip of wine and then I'll get started. Okay. So... Welcome to Miss Barnhart's room. My lesson starts with a woman named Felicia Sims. The first thing I want to say about Felicia is that she is a huge Twilight fan. At least she was like when the articles I read about her was being written. So uh, that's pretty badass. Felicia grew up in Vernon, British Columbia, which is in Canada. It's a small town. It's like a ski resort kind of town up in the mountains. It's very picturesque. Felicia grew up poor, but she had a really supportive, loving mother named Louise McKay. And Felicia claims her family was, they were never normal, but that was okay. Quote, in my house growing up, everything didn't have to be perfect. I never had to be like anybody else, look like anybody else. That's nice. Yeah, it was really nice. She definitely had a good mom, a support system. And Luis was a very relaxed parent to Felicia. She took her to get her first facial piercing when Felicia was 12. Oh, my. Yeah. So it was definitely like a a free range kind of situation. And I don't know (laughs) what facial piercing that was. I watched some interviews with Felicia and she has her nose, eyebrow and lip pierced. So I'm not sure which one happened when she was 12. I want to say that I would let my child do something but I don't <laughs> think I would yeah. I want to let them do it to their face I know it's a hard one because it's like you're going to be stuck with that scar forever and like you can't like your 
your frontal lobe isn't fully developed. But like also we had this conversation before we started. Like when I was 16, I wanted my belly button pierced and my mom wouldn't let me. And I told her she was like violating my bodily autonomy and like my <laughs> consent to my own body. <laughs> and that and then I was allowed to get my belly button pierced. Yeah, but, like, that's four years older yeah. than she was though. I mean, it's tough. Like, like I don't pass judgment either way, but yeah, it, you know, it would just be a hard hurdle for me to get over mentally. Yes. I would, I would just worry about making the wrong decision for their future. Like you said, like you regret but like, getting does a done. lip. Like I, regret, I like, I slightly regret getting my belly button pierced because it does leave a big scar, but like yeah. also like, I don't know, like, does it really matter that much if your kid has like, they want to be emo and they have a lip piercing for a few years? I, I think I would rather my kid do like try out getting a fake one and just make sure that they really like it because yeah. you know that's so young you change your mind like I got a tattoo when I was 18 and I already like don't really care about it that much yeah and especially like, eyebrow piercings they live a they live a pretty big scar yeah it's um, just a really big decision yeah and I mean I get it like no judgment either way but like th this parenting style was very loose Felicia ended up getting pregnant when she was 15 with her high school sweetheart Brennan Hogan and then she ended up pregnant again two years later with her second child and I think this was like her last year of high school maybe right after she graduated but either way, she's a very young mom, which probably would cause a lot of stress in most homes. But Felicia's mom just accepted the news calmly and offered Felicia all the support that she needed. So she had a lot of support at home, but like that's not to say that things weren't a struggle. The family lived in a tract home and lived mainly on public assistance, often like very much struggling, like even to put food on the table. By the time she was 20, Felicia had moved out on her own. She had a small apartment, but like she still relied on the Canadian welfare system. I mean, she had two small kids and she was doing this mostly by herself, which is completely understandable. She did have an on again, off again relationship with Brendan, who's the father of her first child and her high school sweetheart. But Brendan struggled with alcohol and drug addiction. And like because of this, he really struggled to stay employed. He sometimes worked in construction or at a meat packaging plant, but like it was really wishy washy, which like put a lot of the burden on Felicia. And of course, like caused a lot of arguments between the two of them. Yeah, that's really stressful. Yeah, incredibly stressful. And things get even more stressful. It was under these circumstances that Felicia, when she was 20, found out she was pregnant with her third child. And then at the prenatal checkup, she was told it was twins. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So like a bam, bam. And then things get even more complicated. After the checkup, her doctor calls her and she's like, hey, you need to come in tomorrow. And it just didn't sound good. So Fel yeah, that never sounds good. <laughs> no. I mean, first of all, getting a phone call is pretty much always bad. <laughs> yeah, you don't days. you don't want your doctor to call you. <laughs> <laughs> I just want the automated text. Uh, oh, let me God. know that it can just be me during COVID times. Wear a mask. <sighs> like I don't want a phone call. <laughs> no, I got called by a Memphis number today, and I was like, oh no! Like I'm almost certain. I'm almost certain it was like one of my children's parents, not like actual children, but like yeah. My students' Your parents student. calling about something, and I was just like, "Not today!" Like, I'm, I'm gonna let that go to voicemail. Yeah, <laughs> that happened to me the other day too. But I realized it was my hairdresser calling oh. me back, and I was like, oh, "Okay, okay." <laughs> yeah, it might have been my vet because Ghost does need his like a his rabies vaccination. That's probably what it was. Probably. But like, I'm going to take him. I'm just waiting until after the holidays. <laughs> I don't uh, need the vet to tell me what to Rabies do. are a different rabies, for I mean, it's day. not like we have a possum in our house. Oh, wait. Right. No fleas. <laughs> no fleas. Or... <laughs> <laughs> I'll take him. But like, he's not an outdoor cat. Like, I'm not really worried about rabies. It can wait. Yeah. He's not an outdoor cat. What does he even need? Tick stuff, flea <laughs> stuff for heartworms. He he's only escapes cat. our house every other day. <laughs> <laughs> he's just an indoor cat. He's an indoor cat. <laughs> but anyway, so Felicia went to the appointment the next day and she brought her mom because she was nervous. And uh, at the appointment, her doctor sat her down and they were like, you know, there's like really no easy way to say this, but your twins are co-joined. <laughs> Hi guys. So it's currently the break between lessons right now. And it was just brought to my attention that I've been saying co-joined instead of conjoined. Um, 
I know that it should be conjoined, but I'm drunk and I'm very, very sorry. And I know that this is about to drive some people crazy, but please bear with me while I talk about some conjoined, not co-joined twins. And not only that, but they're co-joined at their heads. Oh, wow. Yeah. This was extremely high risk. The doctor made it very clear, like, you know, like there's a very small chance they'll even survive. And if they do survive, we don't know what kind of quality of life they'll have. There's a chance that their brains won't function properly. There's a chance they'll be paralyzed. We don't know what's going to happen. They didn't see this when she was there getting scanned. They did, but it was like the ultrasound technician. And so she had to come in and sit down with her doctor to have oh. this conversation. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I would have pulled the doctor immediately. Okay. I, yeah, I should I mean, not I say I would have. I don't okay, really know how this works. Yeah. Um, but like it was the next day. So it, it, it was soon after Yeah, the doctor kind of told her, like laid it all out on the table. They're like, you know, like the option is you can go through with this pregnancy and the chances are very slim that they'll even survive. The chances are even slimmer that they'll have any kind of quality of life. So like the best option might be to terminate your pregnancy. But Felicia refused to do it. She said she didn't even consider it. And so she didn't terminate her pregnancy. She went through full term. And in a 60 Minutes Australia interview, Felicia says that she feels like really lucky to be their mom. And she feels like these girls chose her to be their mom because you know, like if they were born to almost anybody else, they would not have made it. Most people would not make the chance to go through with the pregnancy. And that's totally your choice. Like it doesn't no judgment either way. But Felicia chose to go through with it. The twins were given about a 20 percent chance of survival. But Felicia says like from the start, she just knew they were going to be OK. A month before they were born, Felicia had a dream and she said this dream was of their birth and it was, quote, completely the way it happened. She gave birth Ooh. in this dream and she, quote, heard them crying in the dream just like they cried when they were born. And she says, I just knew they were going to be fine. Were they born C-section or vaginal? Yes. Yeah, no, it was it was a C-section. Like they they knew oh, it was yeah. going to have to. What be. am I thinking? There's no way <laughs> yeah. vaginally would happen. There's no way vaginal, but like they they were a C-section. So like when she went in, and I was kind of impressed with this. I don't know if the U.S. does this, but like when she went into the hospital to have her planned C-section, like everyone in the hospital knew that like this probably wasn't going to end well. So like on hand, they had Felicia before she was even like put under anesthesia. I don't know if you're, you're not put under anesthesia for a C-section, but put under whatever, put under the knife. She was like, she had to meet with grief counselors and social workers just to like discuss like what might happen and like make sure she was okay. But Felicia says she was feeling calm. Like she had this dream. She like knew exactly how it's good, how it was going to go. And she was right. The twin girls, Tatiana and Krista were born at 34 weeks and they didn't need any medical intervention besides oh, wow. the C-section. Yeah. They were born pretty much completely healthy. As expected, they were craniopagus twins, which means they were connected at the head. So they had separate necks, bodies, arms, legs, everything else. But the sides of their skulls were fused together. Were their brains connected? Yeah. We'll talk about that. Wow. Yeah. This, uh, this gets kind of wild. So... This kind of co-joined twins is incredibly rare. It occurs in only one of 2.5 million births. And then out of that, only like a handful of children survive. Very, very rare. The twins stayed in the hospital for two months after they were born just for observation because they're like, we don't we don't know how to handle this. Like, we got to make sure they're OK. <laughs> very rare. Mm -hmm. While they were under this observation, Felicia was forced to make a very difficult decision on whether or not to separate them because they're like. Because there have been other circumstances and the surgeon that worked on this case had separated twins before. But in the cases that he separated twins, they needed to be separated. Otherwise, they probably would have died. Whereas with these girls, like it, they seemed OK, like they seemed like they were going to survive whether or not they were separated. But this separation would be extremely high risk because not only were their skulls connected, but their brains were connected. And so what they had was called a thalamus bridge. And your thalamus is a two-lobed organ like inside your brain. And what the girls had was this like long piece of tissue that went between their thalami. 
And it was kind of like a bridge connecting their two brains. To separate the twins, the surgeons would have to cut through the brain tissue, which uh, had like a very likely chance of being lethal. It's like a lobotomy for newborns. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Like it was it was a really scary situation. In the end, like because the girls faced no immediate health risks staying connected and because like the separation surgery was extremely risky, Felicia opted like not to have them separated. I think this was a good decision, especially because like if they... Like there have been co-joined twins that like later on in their life decide to be separated and like they know the risks as adults and can make that decision. So I think I think this was a great move. And it was because, as we know now, even though they had separate bodies and separate organs, their vascular systems worked together. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Mother's intuition. Yeah, she totally. nailed it. She nailed it because like their their bodies were pumping blood through both of their bodies. Their bodies kind of work as one unit. And if they they were to be separated, they would die, at least oh with our gosh, t- medical that's technology. So crazy now. that they like found that out after the fact. I know. Yeah. And I mean, technology has come a long way in the past few years. And I mean, the doctors knew that if they were to separate them, the chances were not good. But yeah, now it's just like, okay, we should definitely not try this. Don't do that. (laughs) But yeah, no, no, please no. And the girls have grown up co-joined. They've grown up in their grandmother's home. They're surrounded by a supportive family. So they have their mom, their grandma, their three siblings. So they have Rosa, Christopher, and Shaylee. They also have three cousins and their aunt and their uncle. So there's a lot of people in this small house. It takes a village. It takes a village, but also like that's kind of allowed the girls to have a more normal life because it's not like they're the only children of their mother like who's freaking out over them all the time. There's <laughs> yeah. a lot of chaos in the home and they're kind of allowed to like run around and get get hurt and yeah. live like normal kids. What if I just said cliches this whole time? Takes a village, <laughs> mother's intuition. <laughs> I mean, isn't that what you've been doing? Yeah, I, I'm just saying like, what if I continue? <laughs> I mean, do it. <laughs> All cliches are nothing. <laughs> I'm fine with it. So I just want to like take us down a side road really briefly. I said they had three siblings, Rosa, Christopher, and Shaylee. And uh, Christopher is an interesting part of this story because he actually had a twin in the womb and he absorbed his twin. Whoa. So he has the strength of a full grown man and a little baby. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, no, but also like he... Like, this is crazy. So he absorbed his twin and like all you can see of his twin is he has like a hairy patch on the back of his on his back, like between his shoulder blades. Really? And so that's like where they got absorbed or like, I don't like that's and part that's of like his twin his scalp or something. I don't know. Like the article didn't really make that clear, but I think so. And it, This six-year-old Christopher, like most of my information was taken from one article where this reporter, I forget their name, I'll mention them later, but they stayed with the family for a while and they were talking to six-year-old Christopher and he told them that when he doesn't feel like being himself, he can switch to how his twin feels. And so like if he is mad, like if he plays a video game and loses and he's mad, he controls his like feelings by switching to how his twin feels. And then like until like himself, Christopher like calms down and then he switches back to how Christopher feels, which is just kind of like, I don't know, it kind of like foreshadows the stuff we're about to talk about. And also, I don't know, it's just like real. Like, well, it. I mean, he's six. A, so. Yeah, I was going to say, like, is it a six-year-old's imagination or does he have two brains? I don't think that he, he definitely ridiculous. does not have two brains. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, but who knows? Like, it maybe, uh, like, it most likely is just, like, him being a six-year-old. Yeah, but just like, a thought process Just for a him. thought process. But, like, we also have, like, that twin tuition thing. And, like, maybe there is, like, still a part of his twin with him and... You know, I don't know, but like, I just thought that was a cool tidbit. Yeah, it's like the placebo effect. I wonder <laughs> <Kind of. laughs> like, if they took a bunch of six year olds and they're like, listen, you used to have a twin when you were in mommy's belly, but you absorbed him. And, you know, that spot on your back. That's your twin. I wonder how many of them would feel like they. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> they mean, when connect. you put it that way. <laughs> I don't 
know. I found it interesting. And like, it could also be the fact that Christopher has like been with his twin sisters who do have a co-joined brain. And so maybe that's part of it. And like hearing them talk about their experience. But yeah. I don't know. Like that just fascinated me. Like also the fact that there was like another set of twins in the family and like they also absorbed their twin. I don't know. It was just interesting. And twins, that's a genetic thing. If you have twins in the family, you're more mm-hmm. likely to either be a twin or give birth to twins. Yeah. Doesn't it like skip a generation? Like if you are a twin, they say that, but I don't think it works like okay. that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But yeah. I, yeah. So it, it, Clearly, like with this woman or her husband, I don't know where the twin gene comes from, but or not her husband, her baby daddy. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to look into it. But so back to the home, the the small home was like very crowded, but like it was good because there was every like a lot of people to chip in and help raise the twins they got to have a pretty close to normal life they had a lot of siblings and cousins to play with built-in support system they enjoy going to the park taking swim lessons they have like a special bicycle that they can both ride at the same time and they oh, pedal in tandem oh my god yeah, isn't that cute they go sledding they go cross-country skiing they like to play with their uncle's puppy they like for all for all things considered, like they're doing pretty great as they're doing kids. better than I did as a kid. <laughs> How many times have I been cross country skiing? None. Never. <laughs> I never will. <laughs> but like I also want to point out that like a lot of the articles I was reading were written when the girls were like between four and ten, and now they're like thirteen or fourteen. So their hobbies probably have changed. But this was what was in the articles from when they were little. But like overall, yeah, they're pretty normal girls. They attend public school, they have friends, they are developmentally delayed by about a year, and they're academically delayed by like a little more than that. They read at like a kindergarten level when they were in fifth grade. Medical experts attribute that mostly to the girls just having to learn to do so much more than the average child. Like their brains are working like overload to work together and work like with someone else and function in a world that's like not made for them. Yeah, it seems like tenfold for all the neural connections Mm -hmm. that have to be made for them to do anything. Exactly. And like also their brains are slightly like irregularly formed and a little asymmetrical. So yeah, those like extra neural connections have to be happening. It takes a lot more energy for their bodies. And so it delays them a little bit, but like they're still pretty much okay they are fairly healthy for the most part they do have like some vision and dental problems they have type 1 diabetes and like mild epilepsy but other than that they're doing all right they have very different personalities Tatiana is like super outgoing she's lighthearted. she's high strung Krista's more reserved she's also described by her mom as like more of the bully she tends to like have like more negative reactions to things and lose her temper a little more easily she kind of initiates most of the fights but she also like likes to joke and make people laugh Tatiana is also smaller than Krista so Tatiana's heart and kidneys do the work for some of Krista's body that takes away like Tatiana is a god I'm blanking on the word uh her um what do you call it when you like you're burning calories metabolism yeah thank you you're welcome (laughs) Tatiana's metabolism has to work a lot harder than Krista's so she's a little skinnier she's a little smaller But like Krista, like she's a bit bigger. And so like she kind of like drags Tatiana around. But like that seems to work well with their personalities. Like Krista's more the leader. And then Tatiana seems pretty happy to like go with the flow with Krista. I watched like a lot of videos of them like playing and like Krista definitely like drags Tatiana around. (laughs) Um, And it was like pretty cute. Like they seem to work really well together. And like they have to because not only do are their bodies connected, but their brains are connected. So like we said earlier, Tatiana and Chris's brains are connected by their thalamus. And among a lot of things, the thalamus is the part of the brain responsible for relaying sensory information and it facilitates neural loops that create consciousness. Because of this connection, even though they have different bodies and technically different brains, they share sensory information and their conscious thoughts. Okay, that's crazy. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. Okay, so they can like hear each other's thoughts like all the time? It's unclear 
And like, we'll kind of talk about it, but to that point, like there's not a lot of research that's been done on them because the family has kind of like tried to shield them from that. So they have not agreed to very many like lab laboratory studies on them. They don't want them being poked and prodded. They don't want them feeling like they are some kind of medical experiment, which I think is great. But they have agreed to like a few tests. There's a video from when the girls were infants like just born. And one of them received a finger prick for a blood test. And when she got the finger prick, both girls started crying in perfect unison. That kind of like put the seed in people's brains. They're like, can the other one feel what's happening to the other one's body? Also, right after they were born, giving one girl a pacifier caused both of them to stop crying. So they were both soothed by the one pacifier. This is crazy, but when you really think about it, them sharing a brain or at least part of their brain connecting, it makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense, but like it's still mind blowing. And like it this is. is the only the only case of its kind, like at least in recorded history. So people are like losing their shit over this. <laughs> um and then like as they grew older, like these behaviors became more and more apparent. So like I was saying, a lot of my information came from a New York Times article by Susan Diminis. And she spent time with the girls in their home. And she describes a story where she was like watching the girls go to bed and they had like a cup of juice. And uh, Krista like picked up the juice and she goes, I'm drinking really, really fast. And then she like just starts chugging the juice. And when she did that, Tatiana's hand like flew up to her throat and she goes, whoa, like she can feel her chugging the juice. And then it became a game. Like Krista passed the cup to Tatiana who started chugging the juice. And then Krista did the same thing. She like grabbed her stomach and she's like, whoa. Oh my gosh. Okay. Now I need to go and see these videos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or read this whole thing. It's wild. And so this reporter was like, wow, like, because at the time, these girls were four and like we'll learn more about them as they get older. But at the time, like they weren't really sure if this was happening. But she was like, I saw it with my eyes like they were reacting to each other drinking that juice. They could feel it. Yeah, you couldn't just make that up. Like mm -mm. four year olds have wonderful, fun imaginations. But. I mean, they talk about stuff like, I'm a gorilla and I'm just eating a banana. <laughs> Not like, I'm reacting to what you're right. doing Right, it seems like a weird prank to play as, yeah. a, as a like, small child. <laughs> and so, like, these are, this is anecdotal evidence, but like, there, the, like I said, there were a few experiments. So, in one experiment that was done, they, when they were like two years old, Krista's eyes were covered and there were electrodes glued to her scalp to read like her brain information and then what happened was a, a light like a strobe light was flashed into Tatiana's eyes and even though her eyes were covered up Krista's eyes her occipital lobe lit up in her own brain this shows us that Krista's brain was processing visual information that was seen through Tatiana's eyes so not only do they share like this sense of like feeling when someone's drinking the other thing they can like potentially see out of each other's eyes and that turned out to be true like this experiment worked when the girls when the roles were reversed and then there's also like anecdotal evidence for this so like one of the girls can be watching tv and the way their heads are fused together um it's kind of like off to the side but also like back so like one of the girls can be watching tv when the other girl's head is completely facing away from it and uh, the one facing away will would like when they were little like laugh at the images on the tv when she couldn't see it and oh my god uh-huh i wish i had something smart to say but i don't <laughs> they also like there have been like experiments with the doctor where the doctor will like hold up a different colored crayon in front of each of them and ask them what color crayon it is and like sometimes they'll just like accidentally get mixed up and say the color of the crayon that's in front of their sister's face even though they can't see it. That's like that test where you can have like colored words like red, mm -hmm. but it's in an orange font and you have to say what color it is, but not read it. Yeah. And it's also like, what does that look like to the girls that they can see out of their own eyes, but also see out of their sister's eyes at the same time? I wonder if they can even, they probably can't even actually see it, but they just get the messages to their brains that is like transmitted into these, like for them to interpret. I had I don't know. But like, isn't that what seeing is? 
I guess so. But also like I see you right now, but I can picture what the Eiffel Tower looks like and it's not, I don't see it in front of me. Yeah. Yeah. I it's an image in my true. brain. And I mean, that's, that is what it is. Like she's like sending brain signals from her eyes to the other girl's eyes, but like she can still see it. Yeah. She can still like, interpret it. She can't it. imagine what color crayon is over there, like without yeah. seeing it, you know? And there's a, I watched a video that was crazy. So they, their mom in this video covered one of the girl's eyes and held up like a, a stuffed animal. She, there's a pile of stuffed animals next to her and she just picked one up and she asked the twin with her eyes covered, like what toy she was holding up. And it was a, it was like a pig beanie baby. And she was like piggy. Like she was looking at this toy through her sister's eyes. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. It's not wild. And you can like watch these videos. It's crazy. They can also taste what's in the other girl's mouth. So uh, Crystal likes ketchup and Tatiana doesn't. Oh, no. I know. <laughs> and when Krista eats ketchup, like Tatiana has been known to like claw at her tongue. Like she's trying to scrape it off. I would too. I hate ketchup. Really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't really? know that about you. Yeah. For a long time, I did not like tomatoes. Mm. But now ketchup do. doesn't even taste like tomatoes. I know, but it's made out of tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. But yeah, so like she, they can, they can for sure taste what's in each other's mouth. There was also a time when a thermometer was put in Krista's mouth. And like this reporter that wrote this article, like writes about how like Tatiana's tongue curled up as if it was like around the thermometer, even though it was in Krista's mouth and like Krista's tongue was curled around it. Like Tatiana's tongue did the same thing. And she wow. was talking to their sister Shaylee and Shaylee was like, yeah, it's weird, right? <laughs> She's like, yeah, it is. <laughs> and going back to like what we talked about earlier about how they can read each other's thoughts. They can they describe it as talking inside their heads. Like before they could verbalize this, it was like clear that they could do this because they would do things like stand up in perfect unison and maybe like walk over to a cup. And like one sister would grab it and hand it to her sister and then the other one would drink it. So like she knew exactly what the other one wanted. So they're clearly communicating inside their heads yeah just like babies like they know what they they want even mm -hmm. though all they can do is cry inside their own heads like when they were so young probably before they were in talking you said yeah they like, were able to they to know that they, yeah they know what each other wants but I think it goes beyond that like they talk about having like discussions inside their heads and because the thalamus like it processes information like that so they're able to do it just so wild. And in summary, they share a sense of touch and taste. Tatiana can see out of both of Krista's eyes and Krista can see out of one of Tatiana's eyes. Really? Uh-huh. Yeah. And Tatiana and Krista can each control one of the other person's arm and one of the other person's legs. So they each have control of three arms and three legs. And they can like kind of like they were interviewing it. I watched an interview of like a doctor kind of talking about this. And he says that it's kind of like you have radio stations and you can kind of tune into one radio station or tune into the one over here. And they can kind of like tune into which one they want to like if she wants to look through her eyes or look through her sister's eyes or like move her sister's arm. And I don't know who has like ultimately a dominant control over their limbs because there there is a lot written about how like they do fight physically, <laughs> <laughs> but they can also like feel whatever happens to each other. So like <laughs> the way it was written about is like they were clawing and hitting each other, but then like grabbing their own cheeks because they could like feel what the other one is feeling. <laughs> that just makes me think of when my brother and I were fighting when we were very young strapped into car seats in the car <laughs> and my dad was like that's it like I'm tired of you guys fighting in the car just fight I'm gonna keep driving <laughs> and we we're just like beating each other while we're like both tied down to our car seats and it sounds <gasps> oh not the same God. but that's the that's closest similar. I can really and like think about being a parent to that you can't break them up and put them in separate rooms they're stuck together yeah just beat the crap yeah. out of each other have you seen those parents who like have a huge t shirt and they put the two kids in the t shirt and they have to like either fight it out or hug it out. Oh that I mean I don't I'm not I don't, a parent. I don't know but that I don't seems know about like that a one. bad choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it yeah. No options here though. No <laughs> options here. And like I don't know like the sibling fighting stuff is weird because I mean I'd beat up my brother sometimes 
And like, but like, I was always bigger than him, like when we were young enough to have physical fights. Yeah. So it was never something like that. (laughs) (laughs) I'd always like smack his head into a wall and then like, he'd be crying and be like, oh my God, don't tell mom. Oh my God. I never got beat up. I was so mean. I never got beat up. I remember one time, like throughout my whole childhood, my parents were always like, your brother is going to be bigger than you one day. You need to be careful. And he did one day when he was bigger than me, he like, he got me. He like pulled my hair and it was... Yeah. yeah, he got me and I never messed with him like that again. Yeah, that's where the fights end. But up until then, like, I threw chairs down the stairs at him <laughs> at the bottom. Like, yeah. I was mean. Yeah, sometimes you ever get, like, a wave of guilt when you think about the way you treated your younger sibling. Yes, and then yeah. I'm like, could it have been better? Would our relationship be different now? <laughs> right. Yeah, sorry, Foster, if you're listening. Sorry, <laughs> sorry Troy. <laughs> But so they do share bodily autonomy and sensation and their own thoughts. And like in a lot of the articles I read, the people who wrote the articles were raising a lot of theoretical questions about what this looks like for their sense of self. Because if you look at the traditional sense of self, it maintains that your body and soul are separate. Your soul is within the vessel of your body and your soul controls your body. No one else controls your body and no one else can see your soul. So no one knows what you're thinking. No one else controls your body. But with the case of these two girls, they do see what each other is thinking and they do control each other's bodies. So that raises the question, like, do they see each other as fully separate people or do they see each other as kind of like two versions of like one life form? And if you ask their family, they, of course, maintain that this is two separate children with different personalities, different likes and dislikes. And that, of course, is true. But that doesn't mean that this situation isn't unique and complicated. We see from a very young age that it is complicated. Like these girls, like at least when they were little, this sense of autonomy is blurred. In their younger years, for example, they wouldn't usually say the word we. They would say I when they meant we, you know. Okay, I'll take that with a grain of salt, though, Mm -hmm. too, because pronouns are hard for for young children. Yeah, pronouns are definitely difficult. But like it seems like they weren't completely like it didn't. It's just there was something like in concrete about it. Yeah, it's not like they were mistaking I for me. It's not like they're like me don't know. Yeah, it wasn't like that. It was like they just wouldn't say we. Yeah, it would be I like I'm going to the park when they meant like we're going to the park. That'd be really hard to distinguish. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And like that's that's why this is so interesting. And Deminis describes a time where she was watching the girls each coloring and they each had a piece of paper. And uh, one of them goes, I have two pieces of paper. And so like they each had their own piece of paper. They were coloring separately. But like she described her own piece of paper as like being like the two of them together and they were drawing two separate things. They were drawing two separate things. And so that was just kind of like interesting, but like other times they seemed to like make a point that they were separate. Like there's one time where Tatiana was wearing pink and Krista was wearing gray and Krista goes, I'm in gray. And Tatiana said, I'm in pink. And then Krista, like it, like the, the writer said it seemed like a light bulb went off in her head. And Krista said, I am just me. And her sister repeated it. Mm. Yeah. Credit. Credit for them to say I'm just me, but her repeating it, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And it's it, like, this just always seems like a weird crisscross. Yeah. And like, obviously, they are two different people, but like, their situation is like unique and calls for some nuance in understanding their sense of self and their identities, especially as they get older. And it's going to be really interesting to see how this changes as they get older and what their lives look like. And like if we as the public will even get to see that happen, it's not clear because there was a 2017 CBC documentary about the twins. It was called Inseparable and it followed them through a year of their life culminating on their 10th birthday. But that was really the last time they were ever seen in the public eye. And that was really like one of the only times their their mom and their grandma agreed for them to be seen like that. 
Which makes total sense. They try to keep them out of the spotlight. They try to keep them away from medical experimentation. They want them to have as normal of a life as possible. They have been approached with the offer for a reality TV show, which so far they have declined because like, again, they want to give their children a normal life. They want to keep them out of like the public just gawking at them. Yeah. Um, But at the same time, it's hard because like we talked about earlier, this family is like very financially strained and it's it's a difficult situation. So like the jury is kind of still out on if there will be a reality show. Yeah, that's such a tough situation mm-hmm. that they're in because it's like you don't want to have to sell your soul, your story to be able to just live. But they're under such special circumstances mm-hmm. like they still shouldn't have to be able to do that. And I think it takes a really strong minded person to be able to see through that they don't have to resort to that. Yeah. And like so far they haven't. And like, I'm not saying it would be good or bad. I think like, I mean, right now they're about 12 or 13 and like me or no, they're 13 or 14. And like maybe in their teenage years, they'll decide that's something they want because Mm -hmm. like, of course there will be a lot of opportunities open to them once they are in the public eye. But also like, I can't imagine the strain it would put on a child to have that kind of spotlight on you. And that's kind of what the family is trying to shield them from. I did go on YouTube and I tried to find recent videos of them, which there are none, but there are videos of them when they were younger from like between four and 10 years old. And I watched them. They're super cute. They are like running and playing at the park. Like I said earlier, it is clear that Krista is the dominant one. They have very distinct personalities, even through the video snippets. And uh, you can also see in the videos like they'll like tickle one of the girls and they'll both start laughing oh like as if they both feel it (laughs) yeah it is they're really cute and like the feeling the overwhelming feeling I got from the videos and like I watched the mom and the grandma be interviewed and this is just like a very loving family that has the best interests of their girls in mind I talked about in the beginning how this family was struggling And they've gone through a lot. But like ultimately, like the reason I shared that was I felt like it kind of like set the scene and like it makes it a good situation for the girls because like they've dealt with challenges and this is just another challenge that they've taken in stride. And they also like have a very laid back environment um, and are accepting of like difficulties that come up. And it's been really good for the girls, I think. And a lot of what their mom conveys in the interviews is that these are normal girls with like the extraordinary ability to read each other's minds and experience each other's senses. And that's something that's to be marveled at and appreciated. And I'm excited to hopefully see what they do in the future. I mean, I don't want to like be a voyeur and like in their lives, like when they don't want to be, but I do want to see what happens to them because I like just me too. their I energy. No, yeah, me too. And like their energy, like if you watch these videos, their energy really shines through. Like they are, they are something else. Like they are really, really fun, sweet girls, and I bet they'll do great things. And I'm excited and hopeful that I will get to see that someday. And that was my lesson. I want to cite Wikipedia, CBC, a New York Times article called Could Co-Join Twin Share a Mind by Susan Domenis, 60 Minutes Australia, and Extraordinary Stories, um, which is a YouTube channel. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. All right. Let's hear a word from our sponsors. Yes. So it is New Year's resolution time. And at the top of my list for New Year's resolutions is always to up my skincare game. And we have something to help you with that. That would be Ralphie and Alice. So pretty much constantly, no matter what season is, I struggle with my lips and their moistness, if you will. Either way, I don't know if you love that word or hate it. Doesn't really matter. You know what I mean. Ralphie and Alice has been like my safe haven, if you will. It's where I need to go when my lips need a little SPF protection or if they just need a little pigment without using harsh lipstick on my lips. It's a really nice in-between and they're a really charitable company. I love that so much. Each quarter they pick a new charity to donate to or a cause. They, they put their money where their mouth is. They definitely do. And so like maybe your resolution is even to buy your beauty products more responsibly. Their pack 
packaging is fully sustainable. They even have these little like packaging peanuts in there that you can like put in water and they dissolve. It's a truly incredible. So whether or not you're wanting to like up your skincare game, maybe just like make your like little vanity stand look more beautiful with some like nice looking lip balms on there or purchase responsible vegan sustainable products. Ralphie and Alice is your brand. Please, for the love of your lips, check it out right now. We even have a special little gift for you to use at ralphieandalice.com to get 15% off. That's right. One, five, 15% off just for our listeners. You won't find this deal anywhere else. No, you won't. So don't even try. That's night classy, all one word. Yes. Night Classy, all one word, at ralphieandalice.com. Promo code Night Classy, 15% off. Kiss Star Lips goodbye. Mwah. Mwah. All right. Welcome back from our little break. It is time for my lesson. Welcome to Miss Madden's class. Okay. So I'm going to start this off by saying that I think that Disney makes great movies. But as a corporation, I think Disney is highly overrated. And so you're not a Disney bitch. I'm not a Disney <laughs> bitch and I will never be a Disney bitch. <laughs> Would you consider yourself a Disney bitch? Oh, no, no, no. I okay. like Disney movies and like I I've had good times at Disneyland, but I'm not I'm not obsessed with it. There are some people and I'm sure we all know at least one person <laughs> who is a Disney bitch through and through. Yeah. And like nothing wrong with it, but it's not for me. It's not for me either. And today we're going to take a deep dive into the devil's advocacy as to why Disney as a corporation sucks. Oh, no. (laughs) And how dare you? (laughs) I was like, I feel like I'm going to get some hate for this, but also Disney sucks. I mean, most major corporations suck. Yeah, that's true. It's hard to escape. But most major corporations don't paint themselves as a magical... (laughs) Right. There's definitely some hypocrisy (laughs) happening. (laughs) So this might even be a special like two parter series for me. Um, But throwing it back to blue adept. (laughs) (laughs) Except for this time, I'm not just editorializing a whole fictional. Just reading a 13 year old's delusions on Reddit. (laughs) Hey, we we grow and we glow. (laughs) We do. We've come a long way since then. We Uh, have. Hashtag 2020. Hashtag new year. Hashtag new me. Recording in our <laughs> fucking hallway. <laughs> <laughs> because COVID. <laughs> what a time. What a time. Yeah. So we're not there anymore. Alec, are you going to plug what episode that was? Yeah. That episode was episode 12. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So long ago. So... What episode is this? 40 42. Two. Okay. And then the follow up was episode 13. <laughs> It was a whole thing. What no, were my, please, what were my please topics? nobody go listen to that because it was bad. Um, let's see. Oh, you had Rachel, a good one. which was AI for oh, you. Oh, yeah. That, that was, was a, a good, good one. one. Listen to Haley's part and then turn it off. And then <laughs> on episode 13. That was rando nodding. Rando nodding. Oh, yeah. Those were that two good. good ones. Back yeah, to Haley back. had a good. Haley carried the team there. Yeah. Those two. <laughs> That's okay. There have been multiple times where you've really carried the team, especially the forgotten episode of 2020. <laughs> we gotta like put that on Patreon. We should. <laughs> I can't even bear to listen back to it, Same. but I'm scared. <laughs> well, that's a story for a different time. <laughs> for this episode, I am going to cover just a few of Disney's scandals. Okay. So scandal number one. In 1989, two two businessmen, Nicholas Strachik and Edward Russell, they pitched an idea that they had to Disney executives. So Nicholas was a retired umpire and Edward was an architect. They put their expertise together and they created this company called All Pro Sports Camp. And... I'm sure they did lots of sports things and camp things and they were a business together. Okay. So 
<laughs> they were a sport. They were a business. <laughs> they were camps. It was pro sports camp. It was all the things. All sports. <laughs> all sports pros camps. Anyway, <laughs> so they met with Disney and they laid out these plans for what they called a worldwide sports complex. And the executives of Disney were like, yeah, this is great. This is great. But, you know, like we've got our hands full with like Disney World and Disneyland and Epcot and, you know, all the other parks and resorts that we have. So we're just going to we're going to pass on it this time. But thank you so much for your time. And so Nicholas and Edward go on their way. Until four years later, Disney's like, we're doing a thing. We're opening a thing. It's going to be at Disney World. It's called ESPN's Wide World of Sports Complex. (laughs) Does this ring a bell? (laughs) Nicholas and Edward thought so, too. So the all pro sports business company, corporation, whatever, accuses Disney of Fraud, stealing trade secrets, breaking an implied contract, and breaching a confidential relationship. And Disney's like, what? Did I I do that? Did I do that? (laughs) I can't hear you all of all over all of our new sports complex (laughs) construction. Sorry, doesn't sound like us. (laughs) And so all sports sues Disney. And they're like, oh. This doesn't sound like you, Disney. And then they go on to play more than 200 recorded phone calls that all sports had with Disney discussing all of these plans that they covered in this meeting. Oh, my God. Yeah. So Disney's in deep shit. All sports also outlined 88 distinct similarities between their original plans and the standing sports complex that they let, like they let them build it all and everything before they were like, um, that's ours. That's ours. That's ours. That's ours. That's that's the kind of petty I live for. Me too. Yeah, Let them build it. It worked out. Tear it all down. Tear that shit down. (laughs) Disney stole it. 100%. And the jury agreed all sports. They, they initially asked for 1.4, billion dollars a billion but um they didn't get that they only got 240 million wait all sports or disney all sports yeah that's not that's not fair they should have got more they should have gotten way more yeah they should have gotten 1.4 billion i mean either way they got Money. They got money, but like, uh, uh, does that does that sports thing still exist at Disney? Yeah, it's still yeah, there. I'm sure they're making. They've made way more money. They need off to get royalties or something. Yeah, yeah, it should be like an ongoing, yeah, payment. So I mean, they should have just hired them in 1989 right. when or, they laid out their plans, or like if they weren't ready to do it yet, like called them up when they were ready and been like, hey, like now, now we want you to build this thing. Yeah. Not stolen the idea. Well, that's not what they did because Disney is highly overrated, in my opinion. Are you ready for the next sure. scandal? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Have you seen the movie Brave? The one with Merida. Um, I was. I don't think I've ever like truly sat down and watched it, but I've seen bits and pieces. I okay. saw it. I have not seen it either, but I know the protagonist Merida, mm-hmm. and she is the character with the really big curly red hair. And when the movie Brave came out, people loved Merida because she looked like a real person. She didn't have the distinct perfect smile of Disney princesses. There was no like impossible body proportions. Her hair was this beautiful nest really and people really were drawn to that now brave the movie was produced by pixar but released by disney and pixar was the one that made her normal but then disney was like well here's what we can do let's have a welcome party for our newest disney princess it's gonna be fun we'll have a coronation it will be so cute 
Oh no. All she has to do is change everything about what she is and what she looks like. So they changed Merida's look to be more mainstream with all the Disney princesses before her. They added makeup. They implanted some boobs on her. They slapped on a sparkly low cut dress. They narrowed and dropped her shoulders as well as replacing her signature bow and arrow with a ribbon sash. What the fuck? Was this an animated thing or was this like the unveiling of like a Disney princess like person? It was like an unveiling of a Disney person thing. But like Disney has redesigned many of their princesses. And this one just received a lot of backlash. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Also, wasn't Meredith supposed to be like 12? Yeah. And they gave her boobs and hips. Plenty of their princesses are underage. Yeah, that's true. Most of them are underage. Yeah, that's true. Dang. So just to be clear, this was for, the the edits were for a live event? Yeah, they were doing like an event at Disneyland. Okay, so this is where I'm confused that what you just showed me was a cartoon. Did they have like a princess like dressed up as her and this is what they did or this image that they edited and redesigned Mm -hmm. replaced all the pictures of Merida on all of their websites and everything except for the Mm -hmm. movie. That's what Merida was going to be from there on out. Okay. So not it it was for this event that was live at Disneyland, like her coronation in quotations, but her image was replaced by this new redesigned Merida. Weird. They, yeah, they even changed the color of her dress. Yeah, it's like, it's like the lighter. Turquoise and stuff, mm-hmm. green. Yeah. So people, especially Merida's creators, were fucking pissed. Mm-hmm. Outcry rang on all the internets. There was even a change.org petition to change Merida back, and it actually worked. Disney pulled back the new Merida and they were like, oh, come on, come on back. (laughs) We didn't do that. (laughs) That wasn't us. That was, uh, I don't know who that was. (laughs) That was Merida Severa. (laughs) We were hacked. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, dang it. Shouldn't have been visiting all those uh, sketchy websites. (laughs) We were hacked. But yeah, they, they pulled the new Merida back and replaced her with the old normal Merida. So that's the tale of Merida. And like I said before, you can look for yourselves. Lots of the Disney princesses have been redesigned, given makeup, shrunken noses, all that stuff. Pretty gross. All right. On to our next Disney scandal. So for a very long time, Disney was completely open about not hiring women. What? Disney had a pre-prepared letter to send to any woman who applied to Disney. I'm going to read you this letter from 1938. This woman, Mary Ford, applied to Disney and her her grandson actually found this letter and ignited this whole deal again. I think it was in like 2014, but he found this letter and it reads, Dear Miss Ford, Your letter of recent date has been received by the inking and painting department for reply. Women do not do any of the creative work in connection with preparing the cartoons for screen, as that work is performed entirely by young men. For this reason, girls are not considered for the training school. The only work open to women consists of tracing the characters on clear celluloid sheets with Indian ink and filling in the tracings on the reverse side with point according to directions. That's why all the OG female characters were so fucked up in Disney. <laughs> I mean, that's why still Ariel up. was allowed to be made. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that might. If I do a part two, Ariel's gonna be all up in yeah. part two. Stay tuned. <laughs> you guys hate I Ariel. Mean, the music was great, but like the story was a super sexist. Oh, okay, I thought you were talking about the animation. I no, like, the animation and bad. the story was beautiful, but like if it, I do a out part of the princesses, two, that was a bad one. Same with Sleeping Beauty. Yeah. yeah, and they're Cinderella, all pretty bad. They're all pretty bad. I mean, and these scandals that I'm covering 
are, I would say, some of the lightest mm-hmm. because there's racism, there's sexism, there's oh, ageism. Yeah. It's really fucking dark, and I didn't feel like ending the year on yeah. a really dark There's episode. a lot of <laughs> really horrible racist stuff in yeah. Disney. Yeah. Look for yourselves. Mm-hmm. I just, I could not do it this episode. But yeah, part two, I'm th- I don't want to give it away, but I kind of want to give it away right now. Don't do it. Part two? Oh. Yeah, of my like Disney Ooh, series. So we're doing it for sure? I think so. I think okay. it'll be a good one. I think, cool. I guess you'll just have to wait and see. Alex <laughs> says no. <laughs> well, he we says just, no. Well, the reason we had to do Blue Adept 2 is because Kat said on the air, we're doing Blue Adept Part 2. And then it ended <laughs> and up And then being I read bad. it and I was like, oh God, I have to do it. <laughs> so I'm always reticent now if we say we're doing a part two. But like this, this sounds like a good part I two. I know, like mm-hmm. I've already done, I've already started the research for it. So I okay. know. Can I, I've can heard I say that, it? I've heard that before. Uh, can I say it? <laughs> <laughs> can I say it actually? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he says, okay. So I'm thinking part two will be the, the real stories that Disney movies are based on. Oh, that's on. fun. Yeah. It is going to be fun. That's what I like thought I was going to do with the Brothers Grimm and then it did not turn out that way. Yeah, that's how my last, mm-hmm. um, yeah, that's how, I mean, that's how this one went. It, yeah. it always goes some yeah. different way. But yeah, anyway, Disney did not hire women unless they wanted to apply for the position of inker or pointer. Basically, they would just trace something onto something else. And that's the only job that women could do. I mean, uh, like, sucks that's the only job that women can do. That's not cool. But, like, also that sounds like an awesome job. I'd like to just trace stuff on a piece of paper. You're so much better than tracing things onto paper, Kat. I don't want to say, like, I, I feel like that job is still important. But, okay, it, it, it does sound important. it does sound very soothing. <laughs> yeah. And I would it like it. It is soothing. <laughs> <laughs> if you were paid right and you were happy in that position, I would say kudos to you. Yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking about the stress level of my job. And it sounds very nice to go in and just trace <laughs> stuff on a piece sounds of paper. Sounds numbing. I'm in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair that's yeah. fair all right are you ready for the next yeah. scandal <laughs> all right so disney world is in florida florida is a swamp and there's all kinds of beings in florida including alligators so all over disney now and today there are signs posted warning guests about gators snakes they have rocks like preventing people from going into the water on the beach you know there's roped off fences all that stuff to keep people away from the water but it was not always this way june 14th 2016 a 2 year old boy lane graves was dragged under the water by an alligator. There were no signs on this lagoon beach about alligators. There were no fences. There were no rocks. The only signs of a warning were about to not swim in the water. And they couldn't save Lane. This two-year-old boy, Lane Graves, ended up passing away from drowning. Mm. And to make matters worse, Disney knew they had an alligator problem. More than the regular amount of alligators were in the area because guests and tourists were feeding the alligators. And Disney ignored the warning about how much the alligators were being fed. The hell? So, of course, the alligators wanted to be where the people were. Yeah. Like, I want to be where the people are. (laughs) So they ignored it. Not a fence, not a rock, not a goddamn sign was put up to warn people about this. That's pretty messed up. And, like, people in Florida know not to go near the water. But but how many people who go to Disney World are from Florida? Exactly. Yeah, it's a a worldwide attraction. (laughs) Worldwide. Worldwide, 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 worldwide. worldwide. (laughs) Yeah. So... A fence was only put up in all of these precautions at the Grand Floridian Hotel after this two-year-old had to lose his life and his family had to lose him because Disney ignored it. Yeah. How much does it cost in the grand scheme right, of things? to put up a sign. To put up a sign. A rope. 
in yeah. a rope when they have, you know, they're, they're using sweatshops to make their sweatshirts and then selling them for $70. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. That's, yeah. that's horrific. You can actually look up employees of Disney fucking like staving off the alligators with sticks. Right, like as people are riding Splash Mountain right next to them. What? They're like, really? Yes, truly, Still? really. Still, yes. What? How do they get in there? I mean, Florida is Florida. You can't get rid Florida, of alligators, but like, but like you can when you're in a city and like the they're water, not in a city. They're in the, a swamp, but the water isn't connected to the outside. Is alligators it? gonna alligate. <laughs> okay, I guess you learn something new every day. <laughs> alligators don't alligate. I don't know. I like, have how no are they going to get next to Splash Mountain? <laughs> I don't know. Sure? But they, do you want to see the video? Because yeah. we can look it up. Okay, you're watching a Disney World employee fending off an alligator at one of the Magic Kingdom's most popular attractions, Splash Mountain. It's like four okay. feet from the ride. That's also a small alligator. Like the, you're a pussy. Oh, so are you serious? <laughs> you know, I'm you're not distinguish. <laughs> How did it get in there? You weren't kidding. It is right yeah. there. <laughs> it's right fucking there. It's right across the thing. Oh no, it's crawling through the grass. Known to frequently feed gators in the Bora Bora bungalows. Graves lost his life. The luxurious private villas at Disney's Polynesia Resort oh, no. rent for two thousand. I'm not fucking around, y'all. Built on stilts. Polynesia. I thought this was at Disney World. It is. It is. It's, it's just, themed that way. Oh yeah. And that's the Grand Floridian Resort. <laughs> it's called. The theme, look it up. <laughs> I've never been to Disney World, so I guess I don't know. Just the alligators. A former employee told the rap.com. He says he recommended a fence real. should be erected no. to protect guests, but he claims his warnings fell on deaf ears. Oh my god, a real gator! Guests oh, have been they sure did. And it was an alligator. <laughs> what if the alligator was the CEO? He's just like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, I don't think we need fences. And it's at like, an fuck the crocodiles. The autopsy report ruled that Lane Graves died from drowning and traumatic injuries. His parents said in a I didn't realize when you were telling us this that this happened recently. Does that make it less awful? No, but I imagined it happened like during the 1920s. I and, like, said. They just didn't know. I said the date that Lane Graves. Yeah, she Grace... said 2016. <laughs> okay, I June wasn't. June 14th. <laughs> I wasn't listening. That's okay. Okay. Drunk brain. Drunk brain. <laughs> yeah, it was fucking recent. Dang, I did not know this. I, and they ignored, I, I ignored it. you. I, they ignored it. Yeah, just, like I ignored you. Yeah, you are Disney to me as. They are to alligator warnings. They ignored it. <laughs> the consequences for what I did are much less. Thank God. <laughs> Thank real God. <laughs> Thank Sky Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, there's the alligator <laughs> scandal. Next up, we have the myth of lemmings. Do you know what lemmings are? Is it like a bird? close um lemmings are these cute little like rodents uh -oh. they kind of look like guinea pigs they're in the same rodent family as like mice hamsters gerbils and they live in tundras and grasslands the main legend or myth about them is that they run They'll off run of off, cliffs yeah. yeah and this like suicide pact okay type i was manner. mixing up lemmings and dodo birds Okay, yeah, yeah, that you're thinking of lemmings. So okay. we can thank Disney for this false depiction of lemmings. Is that one of their scandals? <laughs> yes. Okay. Just wait. Okay. <laughs> In 1958, Disney released a nature film called White Wilderness. In this film, you can see lemmings running off of a cliff and jumping to their deaths. Did Disney make them do that? It was all fake. Not only did they make them do that, but Disney bought the lemmings from Inuit children and the producers of the film tossed the lemmings off of the cliff. And then edited together scenes of them running and being tossed off the cliffs to make it look like they did it themselves. Oh my God. Did they die? 
Yes, they died. And they bought them from children? Yes, they did. Because they filmed it where lemmings do not naturally live. So they had to get lemmings in to include them in this Wait, film. You also said they're, they bought them from Inuit children, but they live in grasslands? They live in tundra. Oh, tundra. Okay. Yes. No. Yes. <laughs> yeah, white wilderness is not another racist okay. Disney thing. <laughs> I'm a little drunk. Conjoined, co-joined. Who knows? Tundra, grassland. It's, it's all, all the same. <laughs> yeah, they do not purposely harm themselves. They do not purposely throw themselves off of cliffs. Alaskan wildlife biologist Thomas McDonough believes that Disney filmmakers mi- not only mistook their false beliefs of Lemming's behavior, but also didn't do research into it before they made a fucking film about yeah. it. They wait, was the film about the lemmings? It was about like wildlife in the tundra. And they thought for some reason that lemmings jump off cliffs and then when they didn't, they're like, well, let's just throw them off. What they think happened was that Disney filmmakers mistook their real life behavior of dispersing, which is when lemmings, like when things are going good, they make a lot of babies and their populations go crazy. So they'll break off into packs so that their main pack doesn't have so many. And sometimes in the chaos of it all, like, you know, running and things like that, like they will accidentally, you know, a couple of them may fall off of a cliff. Okay. But it's not like the whole pack of them just running and jumping off. They don't do that. Oh my God. They don't do that. No. (laughs) What the hell? In this land of many mysteries, it's a strange fact that the largest legends seem to collect around the smallest creatures. One of these is a mousy little rodent called the lemming. Here's an actual living legend. For it's said of this tiny animal that it commits mass suicide by rushing into the sea in droves. They reach the final precipice. This is the last chance to turn back. Look, they don't even want to go over that cliff. They're looking yeah. over and they're like, fuck they that. Casting themselves oh bodily out into space. And they're so cute. They're like little guinea pigs. Oh my God, they're probably just pushing them. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh my God. I may drown. Oh my water. God, that's horrible. Because as soon as... <gasps> oh no. As soon as their skin gets wet, they're dead. Because they can't swim. Oh my God. so awful. And soon the Arctic Sea is dotted with tiny bobbing bodies. This is 2020 ending. <laughs> yeah. So is acted out the legend of mass suicide and destruction of a species it would seem to be. Except that nature... I can't believe they just made all this shit up. I know. The Arctic plain, there remains yeah. The small wow, oh my God. that's messed up. So Disney just created that, and now that's what exists in the minds of, I don't know how many people, but a lot of people. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, like, when I was trying to think of what a lemming is, all I could think of was, like, Cliff, and then I thought of dodo birds, and then I thought they were a bird. Yeah, you're pretty damn close. (laughs) So that's completely false. Okay. And, again, this is just, what was that, five scandals, five of many. Disney is fucked up, y'all. Like, I don't even care if we get hate. You need to do your own research. I'm going to leave you with a quote from Michael Eisner. He was the CEO of Disney from 1984 until 2005. This is a quote from a memo of a memo. (laughs) A memo. (laughs) This is a quote from a memo sent out internally to Paramount in 1982. We have no obligation to make history. We have no obligation to make art. We have no obligation to make a statement. To make money is our only obligation. Okay. Yeah, when you have that much influence, like it's just, it makes me angry because like us as teachers, 
we have a position where we have influence over children and we can't go into our job every day and say, okay, like this is just about making money. I just have to keep my job. I don't care what happens. And like, we only have influence. I mean, I have like 137 kids about you have a handful and like, like even with like that small number, we're still affecting lives. We can't just go in and say, this is about money. It doesn't matter like what the consequences are. And if you're a corporation and this happens over and over again, if you're a corporation has that much influence, like sure, your bottom line is making money, but like that doesn't absolve you of having a negative, like a negative influence over other things. And that doesn't absolve you of having to apologize for like past wrongdoings when like the times change and like that's not okay anymore. Money can make you evil, I think. And yeah, and and it did. And as teachers, you know, we don't get commission or anything like that for how well no. our kids do or anything like that. We can't even think about the money because if we do, then it's just honestly depressing. But like still and like like teaching is a job. And like, it does not have to be your whole life or your whole identity or consume all of your time, but like, you still have to take responsibility if, if you Mm -hmm. say something that you didn't mean to say, or it's perceived the wrong way, you still have to take responsibility. Yeah. But when you have lots of money to back you up, apparently you don't. And you get to send out memos like this and you get to shrink girls' shoulders and add makeup and take away their bow and arrow. Yeah, it's messed up. His so. defense, he did like make all the '90s Disney movies that were really good. So that's what I'm saying. I mean, but the '90s, are good. the the movies are good, but they're still like fraught with issues. He did not, yeah, and he did not make these movies. Think about the creators who actually made them, who are just at the you know the qualms. I don't even know if that's the right word, but. They're at the mercy of this guy who has all the power in this company. And of course they want to make it good. It doesn't matter how much they get paid because they're living their passion. They're creating art, but to him, it doesn't matter. It's not about the art. It's about the money. Yeah. And they make that money. Just Disney was like crashing in like the eight, the late eighties. And then he made like little mermaid and lion King and beauty and the beast. And like those movies, like they, like they, they do have value, but at the same time, like there are a lot of problematic things embedded in them. And like, you still have to take responsibility for that. And this was before he was involved with Disney. This was when he was still at Paramount. Oh, two years before he was even CEO at Disney. So I can't imagine his mindset really shifts too yeah. much. And I don't remember when Disney and Paramount became entangled. Also Lion King is a ripoff of a whole other thing. Really? Which we'll talk. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Stay tuned. <laughs> okay. Man, I'm at the edge of my seat. <laughs> <laughs> well, my sources for this lesson, if you guys don't have any other anecdotes, oh, no, no, no. Okay. Well, we have ABC news, an article called Disney owes $240 million for stealing ideas. Jezebel.com, an article called Disney pulls sexy Merida makeover after public bashla- backlash by Tracy Egan Morrissey. Grim Life Collective YouTube channel, realrundown.com, an article called Recent Disney Controversies, Criticisms, and Scandals by L.C. David, and Snopes.com, an article called Did Disney Fake Limbing Deaths for the Nature Documentary, White (laughs) Wilderness? And that is my lesson on Disney scandals. Oh my gosh. Well, stay tuned for next week, I guess. Thank you so much, Haley. And if you liked this, please rate us, review us, subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts. Tell a friend about us. It's the new year. Maybe someone wants to start a new podcast. And you can also support us on Patreon. There are so many projects we want to do, so many things we want to do, and your Patreon money helps make that happen and helps keep this podcast afloat. So please consider doing that. If, uh, I mean, you can think about just a little. And we also have fun content on there. So uh, keep it in your brain. Thank you so much for listening. And three, two, one, class dismissed. dismissed.